While the Israeli government is active in solving day-to-day -day problems, there are long-term strategic needs that the government hardly has the time to focus on. Israel has been forced to confront complex and uncertain situations which threaten its existence, such as the surprise of the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the Iraqi and Syrian nuclear reactors which Israel had to destroy, and Iranian aggression and nuclear program. In order to strengthen Israel's future, a team of experienced national security experts, intelligence officers, academics, and former decision makers of the highest level, including those who have headed Israel's national defense apparatus, have established JISS, Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. There's a reason why the term security, not just strategy, is in our name. We see the threats to Israel's security. We have among us some of the best minds that have dealt with these threats over the years. According to former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, JISS is an important component in strengthening the State of Israel. JISS's research and strategic teams strengthen the State of Israel by providing defense and diplomatic counsel to Israel's leaders, training the next generation of Israeli national security analysts, briefing foreign leaders and policymakers on Israel's security and foreign policy options, engaging with leading global think tanks, institutions and universities like trends in the UAE and the think tank of the Indian Ministry of Defense, conducting in-depth research to formulate multiple strategic alternatives to dilemmas Israel is facing, advancing pragmatic policies that keep Israel strong and will lead to peace in the long term and appearing regularly on global networks across five continents. Colonel Aaron Lerman joins me from Jerusalem. We're also joined in by Dr. Uzi Rubin, a senior fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. JISS experts have written policy papers and influenced Israel's relations with Middle East countries, great powers like the US, Russia, and the European Union, China, India, and Turkey as well as major international organizations. What I believe is unique in the Jerusalem Institute is its uh, no-nonsense attitude, no rosy-tinted glasses, no false idealism. We look reality in the eye and we give our opinion according to reality as we see it, whether it's popular or not. JISS is headed by Professor Ephraim Inbar, president of JISS and Middle East national security expert. Reserve Major General Yaakov Amidror, former National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister. Reserve Colonel Dr. Iran Lerman, former Deputy of Israel's National Security Council. Dr. Uzi Rubin, founder and first director of the Israel Missile Defense Organization. Reserve Major General Eitan Dangot, expert on Israeli-Palestinian relations and former head of Israeli government activities in the territories. Professor Eitan Gilboa, expert on U.S.-Israel relations. Dr. Emmanuel Navon, expert on Israel's international relations and Israeli-European relations. Dr. Oshrit Birvadkir, expert on India's foreign and defense policy. Dr. Hai Eitan Cohen Yanorojak, expert on modern Turkey. Dr. Jonathan Spire, expert on Iraq and Syria. Dubia Gehring, expert on China. At uh, JISS, we have the best team possible to deal with the main challenges to Israel's security. We are the only think tank fully dedicated to the struggle for the future of Jerusalem, the unified eternal capital of Israel. We have been for years at uh, the elbow of decision makers, and we already have evidence that people listen to us at the Good afternoon, please be seated. We would like to begin. Hello, I'm honored to open this uh, meeting on uh, the uh, reserve forces. It's an important topic. Hopefully we will come up with several insights during our discussions. It's very important to Israel's security. Now I'd like to invite uh, the uh, director, the president of the JIS JISS, Professor Ephraim Inbal, to give his opening remarks. And even if I hadn't spoken too much, applause are always welcome. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, everyone. At the beginning of this day, I'd like to thank Professor Colonel in Reserves Gabi Siboni, who came up with the idea for this day and really worked very hard to organize it. Uh, the uh, neglect of the reserve forces, especially in the ground forces, which is the topic of this day, uh, bec uh, this happened uh, because of several uh, topics. First of all, the assessment that the chances of an all-out war, the chances are diminishing, so we don't need a large orbit. And also this opinion that standoff fire and intelligence will solve the problem and ground forces no longer need to conquer territory. These are very uh, pervasive thoughts in the IDF, and of course there were economic and budgetary constraints. So you know you always uh, cut back. Uh, the easiest place to cut, to make uh, cutbacks are the reserve forces. But I think this is a strategic nearsightedness, uh, strategic myopia mainly, especially the miserable comment that the missiles that Hezbollah has will uh, rust this. It led us to a not so successful war back in 2006. You need a large military force in case a war breaks out with Hezbollah, or if we decide on a preemptive strike, and we should consider that seriously, I believe. I must quote Professor Echeskil Dro, who said that in the Middle East there's high probability to uh, low probability scenarios. Can the Muslim brothers uh, regain the power in Egypt? And you need time to establish military capabilities, the procurement of a weapons training. These things don't happen overnight, so you need to prepare. Surprises can always happen. The neglect of the reserve forces is also an outcome of government decisions not to allocate enough money for defense purposes. The new chief of general staff Herzi Alevi, and we wish him the best of luck, has asked for an addition of 1 billion shekels to the security budget. The society in Israel must be ready, and so must the politicians be, uh, to forego an increase in the standard of living just to uh, be certain that we actually li live. There's no room for populist views when we uh, contemplate the dilemma of uh, cannons versus butter. And I hope that some of the messages that will be expressed today will uh, receive an echo in the Israeli public opinion. I'd like to thank all the participants in today's conference. Hopefully, we will learn a lot from this day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm now honored to invite a Lieutenant General in Reserves, Member of Knesset, Gadi Eisenkot, former Chief of General Staff. Uh, Gadi, please. Hello, good afternoon. I would like to congratulate you all for this conference. It's such an important conference, such an important initiative, and I'm wondering whether such a conference could have perhaps taken place uh, over the past 50 years, uh, three or eight months before the 73 war. What would the conference look like if the same question would have been asked, is there a crisis in the reserve forces and are we prepared for the next war? If such a conference would have been held, we would have found ourselves in a completely different uh, situation with respect to social cohesion, tremendous. Back then, there was tremendous appreciation for the reserve forces. Uh, the social cohesion was at a very different place. And I guess the answer that would have been given after the impressive achievement of 1967 would have been that the IDF is prepared for the next war, and this is why it would have been very important. And I think that today as well, the reserve forces are critical for the functioning of the IDF in times of war. And moreover, this is something I thought in the past, and I still think so today, the IDF 
cannot fulfill its vocation in an all-out war without the reserve forces. So the question that remains to be asked is what are the future uh, threats after the last war was back in 73, even though in 1982 as well uh, divisions were recruited, seven or eight divisions uh, were used also in the second Lebanon war and in Operation Defensive Shield as well and then Protective Edge, there were, I think, four divisions. And the question is, how will wars in the future look like? And what will be the uh, uh, reference uh, uh, threat that the uh, IDF needs to prepare for? That uh, main uh, threat is that of a multi-theater war, a comprehensive all-out war in two or three theaters with standoff fire and an ongoing attack and cyber attacks. This is the most basic threat. And we must assume, even though in the past 40 years wars were characterized by a war that was in one theater, and uh, ever since 1973, the IDF did not recruit all of its force to realize what must be realized in an all-out war. And if we focus on the Second Lebanon War, the IDF perhaps used its ground forces in mere uh, small fractions. At the height of combat, there were maybe 8,000 or 9,000 uh, soldiers inside Lebanon. And on anybody who's familiar with the orbit, that means less than one division. And the reference threat needs to be that the IDF will have to participate in all the combat theaters in all areas, whether it's cyber, ground, air, or sea. And the IDF will probably have to attack simultaneously and gradually in two theaters and use fire in all areas of war uh, to uh, use fire 360 degrees, especially because of the flexibility of the Air Force. And the purpose of the IDF is very clear. Even when people are talking about the role of the military and the relationship between uh, the civil society and the military, but it has one goal, the IDF, to protect and defend the state of Israel, guaranteeing its existence. And that's true both in uh, uh, the reserve forces and in the conscript and the basic test of the IDF, it sounds maybe like a slogan, the basic test of the IDF is that of the capability, not merely its intention. When it builds its power and manages risks out of the understanding that even 10 billion, even if 10 billion shekels are added to the IDF budget, the blanket will still be too short, and then it means that the IDF needs to manage its risks. And the main test is the entire military capability of the Middle East, which can impact the IDF and the State of Israel. The IDF IDF basically it deals with a lot of threats. There's the conventional threat of militaries, even though this test hasn't uh, this hasn't been put to the test. Uh, the option of the maneuvering of uh, divisions using the navy, etc. And the IDF needs uh, to also prepare for a non-conventional war. That what had the situation in Syria until eight years ago, they had 200 tons of uh, chemical warfare materials that uh, could have been used against Israel either through airplanes or on uh, missiles and rockets and um, most of this capability was uh, destroyed, but it's very easy to rehabilitate it. They have the means and the know-how, and if the Syrian military would want to go back uh, to uh, this ca these capabilities, they can do it, uh, and uh, not, it won't take them too long. And of course, the main threat is uh, the Iranian nuclear program, and today it's in the most advanced point since uh, they launched this program. Also, with this, uh, with respect to the scope of enrichment and the percentage of enrichment, and from what I read in the press, also the beginning of uh, an arms uh, great capabilities, and that's of course the biggest threat. And the third threat, it has the soft name, but it preoccupies us constantly. It's preoccupied my generation. I was drafted to the idea five years after the '73 war, and that's the subconventional threat of uh, quasi-military organizations uh, with very. Various military capabilities, global jihad, Hamas, Hezbollah, 
uh, the GAP, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and uh, from uh, this in-depth analysis, uh, this uh, decides our orbit, our procurement, and uh, the availability and preparedness of the idea for war. And ultimately, there are a lot of comments and a lot of uh, angry prophets, and I'm uh, grateful uh, for every piece of criticism. Sometimes it's because people are stuck uh, at what they faced 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years ago, and others are uh, uh, other concerns stem from a real concern for um, the situation, but the criticism should always be based on facts. And sometimes I read articles and uh, they are so far from reality and uh, the situation with respect to the real facts. Those who are in charge of the capabilities, those who know how to make the adaptations, that's the government as the supreme commander of the IDF, the cabinet headed by the prime minister and the minister of the uh, defense, which is uh, the supervisor of the chief of general staff and the chief of general staff who has direct responsibility for the military capabilities. When people say that the reserve forces uh, are not sufficiently trained, usually uh, the uh, that refers to the ground forces because the Air Force, for example, is based on a, an entire group of reservists and there's great compatibility there between the need and uh, the uh, needs between emergency times and war times and the Intel Directorate. They also have proper infrastructure for it emergency time. So the main challenge is that of the ground forces. And here we ultimately need to manage risks. You know, the people who see the full picture and hopefully are doing it correctly. And I believe that this is what needs to be done. The job is taken, so I cannot take it, but that of the uh, prophet uh, that is constantly warning about the end of democracy, the end of reserve forces. I know what people are talking about, and indeed the apprehension and concern for the future of this country, especially by people who had experienced some very difficult events uh, with respect to the 73 war. But ultimately, people need to manage risks. And let me tell you, when I was Deputy Chief of General Staff, there was a committee that Amidro was familiar with, and it did some very serious work. It was called the Locker Committee, and I made a suggestion as the Deputy Chief of General Staff. And back then, the uh, budget was uh, 28 billion shekels of the IDF, and they said, uh, why don't you do another calculation? What do we need to do so that the IDF is at a very good level? Maybe not perfect, but you'll feel comfortable with And we did some work. And if I remember correctly, the required budget was between 46 to 48 billion shekels. Ultimately, it's the IDF uh, budget, not the entire defense budget, because that's even bigger. And the next thing, and I hear a lot of comments on that, and a lot of uh, in the news, we hear a lot against the uh, war between the wars. It's become the new uh, tool of the IDF. And let me tell you, as somebody who thinks who's made uh, some kind of a contribution to this uh, thing, and it, uh, you know, this concept started uh, way back, even uh, during the time of retaliation attacks. But now in the past decade, it's given Israel some amazing advantages. Uh, the IDF erodes our enemy's capabilities without it. Uh, the Iranians would have had over 100,000 uh, men in Syria. With Iranian presence in every airport, uh, we would have seen Iranian ships in uh, the uh, Syrian port. So there's a, this is a great contribution on various aspects and levels and dimensions. And I've only, and now I just mentioned the northern arena, but even in my time, there were people from the regular army who said that the war between the worms uh, harms them because we're constantly using the special forces, the intel and the fire. But what about us, Brigade Number 7? wants to maneuver inside Syria and uh, target enemy uh, targets. And let me remember, remind you that this came after the quiet decade that came after uh, January 1st, 57 and January 1st, 1967. That was the most peaceful, the most quiet uh, decade after the establishment of the State of Israel. And that was followed by the Six-Day War with all the fears and uh, where the uh, military did its job properly. The IDF needs a very large orbit. Thank <laughs> you.
And the uh, IDF is very big. I'm not going to tell you the exact number, but it's big, over half a million and less than one million. You can check which other militaries in the world have uh, between a half a million to one million soldiers at war. Now, can we maintain the entire million in a full, um, a full capability, full force? Uh, that's a question. And this is why uh, big, the, uh, treating this in a differential way is a necessity, because we know we cannot equip everyone with the very best equipment. I wish we could have included uh, 8,000 APCs uh, that's called Namer to the IDF. It's the best APC in the world. The IDF uh, has the best uh, tank or bat in the world. I don't know of any other uh, military in the world that has a Merkava. Sign three and four with all their capabilities and the ability to train everyone as uh, regularly as needed, just like we train when I was brigade commander in reserves with Habu Shab and Shalom here, he was a brigade commander. Uh, they would uh, train between 50 to 70 days a year, and I see a lot of people sitting in this hall who know this from up close. So this is why the way in which we use reservists, it's become quite expensive, and it links with what Gabi Siboni presented with respect to the gap of reducing reserve uh, days. First of all, because the defense establishment started to pay, and also because the entire network of reservists has diminished. If uh, in, uh, 30 years ago we had about 4,600 tanks, today we have about 170 tanks. But there are other means that are now included, the scope of tank brigades and also their artillery orbit. And you know, when we talk about taking out the border police uh, forces from the military's responsibility, and the military says it will require 63 battalions in a year, and that's completely in contrast to the uh, reserve forces law, which uh, thought that the reservists should be used for emergency times and not for routine security, even though every reserve uh, battalion commander would tell you that routine security is the best thing. And here, this uh, task has increased significantly, especially in Judea and Samaria, by 55 or 60 percent of the ground forces orbit of a uh, protecting the state of Israel is in Judea and Samaria in this tremendous assignment to thwart terrorism every day. When I was a, a battalion commander, we had about uh, seven brigades who did that. and. Uh, in the past, uh, we have three brigades uh, that uh, do the same assignment, but in the past, we needed uh, three divisions, and the routine security task indeed affects us, and I think that the main reservist uh, a uh, task is for reserve time, uh, for the reserves is for emergency time, not for routine times, and just uh, and we need to stick to the reserve forces law. And now I would like to conclude um, uh, my comments, and let me just say I think that we need a large, a well-trained reservist or bat, but according to priority, certain battalion commanders, if you speak with them, they'll tell you that they're well-trained and equipped. Other battalion commanders, especially of inventory uh, forces in the lower ranks, they'll tell you that the equipment isn't good enough and that they don't uh, sufficiently train. And this is a matter uh, of uh, aligning expectation and educating, uh, you know, aligning the expectation between the IDF commanders in reserve duty and uh, those who are in regular military and the way we will use them during wartime. Certain units uh, will uh, be asked to respond in 18 hours, and in other units, it'll take a week, so their preparedness must be differential, and I believe uh, to, that's a condition to maintaining such a large reserve forces orbit. Another issue is um, uh, training. I still believe that the best uh, training are the ones that simulate the war as close as possible, so I'm not really for simulators, and you can achieve that only through the various exercises, a platoon or battalion exercise. And the thing that's uh, closest, something that's uh, the closest to the thing I'll have to do during wartime. Let me say something about preparedness. Just
just like many other basic laws and norms here in Israel, there's a law, a law that compels the Committee for Security and Foreign Affairs to summon the Chief of General Staff and Minister of Defense to come and explain how they realize that the priorities they need to present the intel the picture and to present the units to say which units are trained sufficiently, which are not. And I can tell you from examination that this was done for two years as a one-off thing. And the first time I needed to come to the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee to distribute the law, I asked them to pencil in three hours for me. And I said, by law, you were supposed to summon me so that I'll present the preparedness and then to summon the Minister of Defense. But since you didn't do that, I summoned myself. And this is the preparedness of the idea if I brought the commander of the Air Force, the ground forces, the Navy, the Intel Directorate, we all spoke and we said, here the pre preparedness is 95%, uh, here it's 60%. In emergency storage, it's 70%. And in the Air Force, it's 90%. And we're managing risks in this division. It's 85%. In another division, it's 70%. And we show them a detailed report. And I said, I invite you to take this report. And every day, without asking anyone, just visit any IDF base come and inspect and speak with the commander. Since there were two very diligent guys there, Omer Barlev and Ofer Shelach, some of them did actually do it and did uh, rise to the challenge. But then two or three months afterwards, there was a mili there was a public uh, debate that evolved that the IDF had lost its preparedness. And so a civilian who knew the military well maybe 30 years ago. So there's this parallel uh, talk, and they all also uh, start judging, but what I'm saying is that we have laws and commands and orders and uh, the decisions and responsibility, and this responsibility isn't realized, and you have the state controller, the security establishment controllers, and others who need to enforce and ascertain, and first and foremost, the people who are in these positions, they need to make sure that what had happened in the 73 war won't happen again. And one last comment, just a few sentences. This unwritten contract to prepare and equip the reserve forces units as closely as possible and the understanding that in our reality, time is extremely precious. We can't have the same thing we had in the Six-Day War. Those who know how to use time cleverly will most likely win. And the conscription law, let me just say, to quickly pass it and to take an overriding clause and to overcome all the difficulties of the High Court of Justice and to pass a law that will um, circumvent or bypass all the conscription laws, it will be a tragedy for Israel if this will be achieved by law and will ultimately lead to a fatal, crucial uh, damage to our uh, regular army uh, uh, forces and also to the reserve forces. And one last comment, appreciation and recognition. Whenever people talked with me about role models uh, in various positions, I always said it's the reserve soldier, who's he, whether it's the commander of a brigade, a division, a commander of a regional command, somebody who leaves their jobs, their lives for three weeks, coming to Tselim, putting 30 kilos on their back uh, to train and exercise. And I think the Israeli uh, uh, citizens need and public need to see these reservists as the best benefactors of the Israeli society, and not just in words, in actions, uh, both in recognition and in remuneration, even though the political lobby is relatively weak and the fact that 84% uh, of Israelis consider the uh, reservists uh, as uh, great benefactors and not as, you know, uh, suckers who are sacrificing themselves. And we did this survey. How do you, uh, we ask uh, people, how do you think the Israeli society uh, values you? Uh, these are to the career officers and 30 percent they see us as freeloaders and when you ask the Israeli society over 80 percent sometimes even 90 percent answer that we have a deep appreciation for those who serve out of the understanding that uh, that every citizen in Israel has that this orbit in uh, regular forces and res reservist forces and career officers that's the best insurance policy for the state of Israel thank you We've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, 
Um, we need a microphone actually to interpret. I apologize. Ask them in to speak into a microphone. It's an excellent question. And yes, there is a gap. Because when you do the survey that the actual institute did, then you can see the results. I know all those surveys. I remember when I was in that role. And when the actual reservists ask you if you know, the, say, do the actual public see you as suckers, then usually the answer is yes. And when they do it, if it's based on a division or a brigade, and they ask you, is your unit ready for war? And do you trust your commanders to actually bring you home and be ready to fight? Then in the surveys, the answers are actually very high from that point of view, positive, in other words. There is an enormous challenge. And it's uh, but, but there's an enormous crisis still. So it's like people hiding their eyes from the sun. But such a slow fraction actually do participate in reserves. And if the reservists see themselves as suckers, then, and no one actually appreciates them, then it'll become a crisis. So the results are here. They've shown, they put a mirror in front of us. And boy, do we need to treat it. Thank you very much to Lieutenant General in Reserves, member of Knesset Ghazi Eisenkost. It's now an honor for me to invite Major General Yaakov Amidro, one of our senior um, researchers in our institute, JISS, the Anne and Greg Ross Handler Senior Fellow at the JISS. I'm surprised that uh, for the Golani guys, uh, the applause really helps. I learn new things every day. No, but I have to be very cautious before I speak, because in all my life, I've only done four months of reserves after 2006. Um, in the campaign, there was the whole intelligence commission, and everyone said that if I'm not called out to reserves, I have no insurance. So unfortunately, they were the only four months I've ever done in reserve duty. So I, I can't actually speak it sort of aligned on the same page with you. I'm not at that same level. Reserve duty is part of the whole perception and concept of national security, actually, that was created. But it, it actually contributes a great deal. But you have to understand why this decision was made originally. The, the fact was to our founders that we have to work with very tough asymmetries. A small state, one of the smallest in the Middle East, the state size of New Jersey, and isolated as the only homeland of the Jewish people. There are 22 um, other um, countries and um, homelands and uh, all around us, the Muslim ones as well. So if you're talking about 9 million and a little more from the point of view of the population, then you have to remember that only part of them do take upon themselves on their shoulders the actual burden of uh, military service, and there are others, 20% um, of the Arabs do not. They have made a decision, and the Haredis, the, the ultra-religious, and that number is just going up and up. And so we have to grapple with uh, countries that have uh, that are really densely populated, the Muslim countries. Where do you have the only Egypt, for example, is the only other one with half a million soldiers. And that's the order of magnitude that we're talking about. During the Yom Kippur War, there were 800,000 actually that were actually written down because some of the people that had actually just then finished their um, army, they hadn't been debunked yet. But we're, yes, we have to think about the fact that we have to be preparing for the next, whatever war we've had, we have to prepare for the next war and the next war, even to the 101 war. And uh, it would be enough, it would suffice for us to lose once, and that would be basically the end of the story of the State of Israel. 
So each one sees the things in a different way, and each one has a different importance at a different time. But all these facts, all these asymmetries together, the way you look at them and mix them all up together, basically you have to understand all of these very basic ones because these are the ones you have to grapple with in order to understand the whole perception, the whole concept of national security in the state of Israel. Now, these facts, a decision was uh, sort of added that emanated from our historical experience that was really accentuated even during the time before the inception of the State of Israel. Israel has to protect itself by itself. And undoubtedly, the Holocaust was the infrastructure, was the basis and the foundation for all of that. But it's not a triv trivial decision whatsoever, because at exactly the same time, after the Second World War, the Western European countries took an exactly opposite decision. They wanted the American army basically to remain so that they could guarantee their security and safety. So the USSR at the time gave a suggestion that we would actually with withdraw from the Warsaw Pact countries and we would go back to the Russian borders and the Americans would go back to their bases. And the Western European countries, Germany, France and Great Britain said that they're not willing to accept that kind of idea. So if we talk about the founders of the State of Israel, Israel said that it will do everything to protect itself by itself, while in Europe the perception was totally different the way they saw things. So if you take this demographic asymmetry and you add to it, which was the basis for those who can actually supply the force really to the actual security forces is actually smaller than the size of the population with that whole idea that Israel is going to protect itself, then you find yourself in a terrible situation of a gap from the point of view of the the size of the, the forces of all the countries around us and our, the size of our force. You're talking about two, two and a half million people, while around that you're talking about a multiplication of, by 50. Nowadays, we are nearly 10 million population. I mean, Israel is, is it's 10 times the size of Israel. So if you add Syria to that, Lebanon to that, and of course Iraq, it's very important. <coughs> There isn't an Iraqi army, but during the war of, 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 uh, of independence, and if you look at Tulkarum and everything that happened, and the Yom Kippur war in the Golan Heights, it was the Iraqi war, it was the Iraqi army. So now they don't have it, but you have to take it into account. Don't forget that there were four or five divisions, Iraqi divisions, and, and that is what happened in the war of independence and in the war of... of uh, the Yom Kippur War. So basically, in order to overcome this asymmetry, you had to, first of all, remember, compulsory uh, mandatory draft. So in other words, we're talking about the graduates from all high school, although that was a never fully fledged one with everyone. But the first, the tough years, I would say that the majority of men did join the ranks. It wasn't always full. I mean, Uri Avneri t wrote two books about the War of Independence, Shualei Shimshon, and uh, that was the, the, the Foxes of 1948, and the other one was about that as well. And there were many people who were not Haredis who actually did not go in, whatever you can say, conscientious observers or whatever they were. So this kind of gap was that there was a reserve army that was nurtured by those who'd been in the army for three years, which enabled, and Gadi said it, which enabled us to actually expand the number of formations that actually existed. And at certain points, I think after the Yom Kippur War, that it was it was actually significantly bigger, it, and it did it was enlarged, and it wasn't only ground forces. It, it, the air force, the operational side of it, and especially not the the support um, side of it, cannot actually without its reservists actually function. 
So you have to take it into account that it is really crucial in a state of war, at a time of war. The three component to overcome the asymmetry was the qualitative edge, and a preference was given to the quality, to special um, specific forces, if we're talking about intelligence development of technology, the Air Force, um, the uh, combat SEALs, etc. Because we knew that there, this top quality, we would be able to build our qualitative edge, even if we don't actually manage to expand in numbers. So at least it would be in quality. So these top quality people, they're not in th in um, in Brigade 35, not in Brigade 7 or in the paratroopers, and they were specifically sent to those specific troops. Um, and now, actually, you find them in the cyber school because you understand their strength. But they will not be in combat units because some of them perhaps are suitable, but even some of them who are suitable will not be actually go there. If you're talking about the Talpiot course, for example, yes, they could have been first class commanders in our ground and forces in our infantry, but they won't be. They'll be in cyber. And in other and in in the intelligence. In other words, we need that creme de la creme in other places as well because they have tremendous significance because they can't be in two places at the same time. So if you look, actually at the Talpiot, the two of them, two actually, I mean some of them, but it's very rare that some of them actually do go um, after a certain period of time to the combat units. So only this mandatory draft. Well, actually, I mean, you can't, by the way, have a, a serious reserve army, but only that compulsory, those mandatory um, draft will actually create our qualitative edge, because that's the same way as it is all over the world. The Americans even have a, a number, a sort of a, a problem with their figures. They don't manage to actually recruit these people, and that's United States, where you can imagine the amount of money that are actually paid for their salaries there. So over the years, the reserve army actually, they realized that this was actually that said that they really did contribute to this qualitative edge and what we were talking about. First of all, they do contribute to so much and they everything that they do in the reserve and they actually then <coughs> contribute immensely to our industry, to the military industry, to the air aviation industry. And you can see so many of them actually serving there. And they go into the reserve duty. And when they go back into the aviation and the military industry, it is a tremendous contribution because they know exactly what is needed and what needs to be done. And in some of the actual commands, says they understood that they should bring in the reserve duty soldiers and they brought them in, they integrated them in. I mean, we're talking all the way through the brigade, through the division, all the way through formations. We're talking, um, someone actually went up to me today and said to me, oh, you know, uh, many years ago, we, I was actually in one of those brigades with me, 476, I think it was. So those who actually, during the actual exercises, this integration of the reserve soldiers brings about a situation where the IDF, which is a very young army, a different kind of thinking that really helps the results in those commands and in the headquarters, which really is a fantastic, really fantastic addition and contribution, because otherwise you, you find that they need that kind of maturity someone with that kind of life experience and many years of reserve duty who has undergone many complex campaigns and wars, it really does add so much to the actual headquarters and the various corps. And so the actual IDF really does, is very great, grateful and it really does show its appreciation for these reserve soldiers who do join them. And unfortunately, I went uh, and visited a bereaved family yesterday and he was was the one, by the way, who was the actually the head of one of those commands just after the Six-Day War. And uh, they continued, of course, doing their reserve duty in that command center. And I remember we were using 
um, the intelligence and everything that you read about the revolution that is actually taking place, well, it actually happened there. The intelligence actually took it and it used, and they were working on the various targets and they were doing it in such a way. And the moment he, that specific person, actually uh, came, I saw, oh, I, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel and I explained to him exactly what I need. And immediately he explained to them, he'd undergone it, he'd experienced it. He immediately explained it to everyone to such a degree that during war times, I'm talking about the war, the scenario war that they were creating, he immediately gave the solution at that right moment without even thinking twice. This capability of taking experienced people and putting them in and really improving the level and the quality, and that is co that is connected to qu the qualitative edge and not the quantitative edge from that point of view. So if we are talking about Israeli society, there are people from the, the entire political gamut and from all over Israel, from one corner to the next, they serve in the reserves. And this network, they actually sort of absorb the shocks of the of what is happening around them. I gave a lecture to a reserve um, brigade just a few weeks ago, and I asked some of the really most senior ones, and I asked them how do they feel the tension in the state of Israel. It, uh, we're talking about people who were in Golani in the past, we're talking about a reserve brigade that has been well trained, they know that their capabilities are excellent, and they said that in our unit there's absolutely no impact, each person has their own political opinion, and in Israeli society where words have become ammunition and it really is vitally important. It's not part of, of our national security sort of concept, but it is so important to say a sentence like that. Because I think that our basic um, assumption was that, especially in the Air Force and and for those in the missile defense, then the regular army will know how to thwart any attack should it be a totally surprise one. But the reserves should only join later. That was the basic assumption in order to really just um, sort of beef up the defense wherever it is needed. So in other words, the reserve and the regular would even be able to go out on an assault on the offensive. But over the years, this whole warfare has changed. This, we are now fighting against military NGOs. And some of them are terror, terror net, uh, you know, net force of it, and some of them are hybrid, some of them are more like military sort of com military um, uh, um, brigades, but they don't have those, they have a few drones and UAVs, but they don't actually have tanks, they don't have armored forces, they don't have an air force, very different from the armies that we used to fight with when we were young. So <laughs> the actual combatant and and sort of warfare whole perception of the IDF nowadays has changed completely. They can't rely just on the regular, on the regular army, and that is where they will, for example, if it's in Lebanon. So in other words, the reserve uh, formations will be actually sent to Samer Judea and Samaria in order to, to, to create a lull and to calm things down. And of course, the home front, the, the home front in the next war, its role will be much, much, much harder because they will be really hit by missiles. The destruction, the, the wounded, the casualties is going to really um, to escalate. And so the days of war will be much more complex, and some of the reservists will have to be involved in that, and they will have to be deal in actually ensuring that the IDF will be able to actually move you know, and maneuver itself from place to place without being blocked in any way places, and that might actually happen, so therefore they have to be prepared to do that, and they ha will have to be able, to, under this pressure, to actually move and be able to really thwart all these capabilities, because Gaza might, of course, be joining the that attack as well. So whatever, although the IDF does perceive the regular army um, as those who will actually bear the brunt of it all, the others have to be actually um, 
they will actually have to be able to focus on the specific hardest and toughest fronts. So all the others, the reservists, will have to be able to take over from the regular army. So first of all, you have to look at the reservists and say, don't forget, this is, these are the people that are so important. Gadi said it, for example. These are, I mean, and he's, I asked him, you know, how many days do you serve a year? And he said between 50 and 70 days a year. That is a lot. That is a lot. You have to think that these are civilians, basically. And that's dangerous because you've got to understand that they've got to join immediately. They've got to join the brigade in Janine and they might not come home. So how do you actually continue make it a voluntary service after all the civilians. So you have to do that through, we have to make them more technological. We have to make them want to do this. And now the army is dependent on technology and that is of vital importance. It's a dependence that one cannot untangle oneself from. How can one actually internalize issues of technology and teach new technology and this cutting edge technology and operate it, how can you actually preserve and retain the technical level, not only the storage units, but how can you train all these people who are coming in as civilians, as reservists, to actually learn how to do that? And how do you create those civilians who come for voluntary service? How can you retain their capabilities and their level and the high standard of capabilities? And above all that, the money that since the reservists come only actually really, uh, you actually see it manifest only at moments of, uh, are actually manifest only at moments of pressure. I think that there was, yesterday I saw someone that was coming in, I met someone from the battalion 6555, but I saw him standing actually at the meeting, how, how they actually, um, stopped and thwarted and destroyed that terrorist cell just a few days ago. But um, it'll only actually be manifest during a time of war. It's not every morning. But when we really need them, it'll be too late to then train them and get them ready. And it costs a lot of money. It's too late if you haven't prepared them before that and trained them before that. And uh, the fact we're talking about catastrophic state of this uh, reserves, this is beyond that. And now when I talk to the reservists, and I only talk to reservists, as I said, I myself was never a reservist. I think that we have to really understand how tough the situation is. It's even severer than is expressed. Basically, the IDF, Gadi mentioned it, it would talk about a, a little bit more than 30 billion shekels. That's all. We're not talking about the entire military budget, <laughs> security budget. If God forbid, for example, a bus of, of, pol of uh, the policeman um, basic will suddenly go up on a mine or something, and uh, God forbid that should happen. But it's exactly the same budget. In other words, they have to pay all compensation, God forbid, if people have been killed, wounded, etc. But it's all the same. In other words, it's all the same budget. So if we have got 50 um, policemen less, we, we might we won't have enough money to actually have the reservists. So we have to take into account where are you going to take that money from. And so they have to say where they're taking the money from to say, you know, there's no point saying we, um, you know, it's ignorance if they say, okay, buy less airplanes. I mean, without buying that, you can't do anything else. The, the Americans are extremely $3.8 million. You can buy things only from the United States. That's what the aid actually does. You can't actually. So in other words, you have to, you need that prerequisites of that kind of budget so that you have enough actually um, battalions and brigades standing in the right places because you need to have them and you need to have that responsibility um, adjusted to and prepared in all of the actual fronts. So if IDF does not have top quality and top quantity reserves, they won't be able to carry out the, what they're supposed to be doing on the, the primary fronts. They won't be able to do things if it's not being carried out on the secondary front. I promise we will give each speaker a mezuzah, a mezuzah so you'll get one too. 
Yeah, here you go, a mezuzah from the Institute. The reservist forces, that's just like a mezuzah. You don't have a lot of them at home, but it's necessary and you need to value it. I'd like to invite Dr. Pnina Shuker, who's a researcher in the Institute, and she will moderate a panel regarding the operational and social value of reserves. Now I'd like to invite a former MK of Shelach Gershon HaKohen. I hope he's here and he didn't get stuck in traffic. And Professor Eyal Ben-Ari from the JISS and Colonel in Reserves Ophir Cohen, Chair of the Association for the IDF Reservists. Is Gershon HaKohen here? Okay, so Gershon is probably on his way, and so he'll probably be joining us later. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be part of this important evening in this very important place, the uh, Begin Heritage Center this evening that discusses one of the main challenges which the IDF will have to deal with in the near future. Definitely the new Chief of General Staff, Lieutenant General Herzi Alevi, will have to contend with that, and of course we want to extend them our best wishes of success. And as from the 1980s, I have to say, there's been an ongoing process of um, undermining the status of the military in the Israeli society, which until then was considered holy. And one of the things that uh, express that are a diminished participation in reservist uh, forces on top of uh, the various operational implications this has, for example, a drop in uh, the preparedness for times of emergency. This also bears with it some significant social implications. And this is the topic of this panel we have with us today. And let us uh, perhaps tell you a bit more about uh, the participants of this panel. We have Professor Eyal Ben-Ari, was a professor of anthropology and sociology in the Hebrew University. His fields of expertise are, uh, among other things, uh, the organizational analysis and social analysis of democratic forces and the civil military military relations. He's been dealing with issues in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. He was a member of various public committees regarding HR in the IDF, former member of Knesset on behalf of Yeshatid. Mr. Ofer Shelach today, he's a senior researcher in the INSS, and he's uh, been a commentator on political and military issues uh, for a long time. In 2005, he was a member of a committee that shaped a new um, reserves model for the IDF. When he was a Knesset member, he also also led to the passing of the conscription law, and he was the chair of the subcommittee for the force design and a security concept of the Knesset. We also have Colonel and Reserves Ophir Cohen, the chair of the Association for the IDF Reserves. He's a former battalion command, infantry uh, battalion commander, and he's an attorney, and he is the CEO of Eshed, a real estate company. Gershon Cohen, uh, I will uh, introduce yeah, shortly. He's here. Wow, Gershon. We never lost hope. He wanted to make an entrance, yes, like the true diva <laughs> that he is. So as Gershon comes in, let me introduce him. He was in various capacities in the IDF. He was a brigade commander of brigade number seven. And he was also the commander of the military colleges, the commander of the disengagement, and he fought in the 73 and 82 war. He still uh, serves in active reservist duty, and he's a researcher in the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. So let's start with a round in which each panelist will uh, present uh, their views regarding the reserve forces and the operational social value of reserve duty. And and each panelist has three minutes for that. Please try to stick to the timetable. And let's start from right to left. Okay, hi there. 
First of all, I think there's a need. The IDF is too small. It doesn't have a safety net of reserves. We should perhaps study the war in the Ukraine or what uh, stopped the Russians, especially in the first week where grandmothers who filled Molotov cocktails in Kiev and the territorial protection of Kiev, also participating uh, versus uh, the uh, Russian paratroopers in Astonov, and uh, they had a major achievement. The IDF doesn't have a safety net. Uh, the war, by uh, definition, is an event that uh, can spin out of control. You cannot uh, uh, make certain basic assumptions about a short war. It could be long. Look at the war in the Ukraine. Who cares? It could go on and on, and so could a war here. And uh, beyond the uh, actual need, two main comments. Just as the regular military, the conscripts, uh, that's uh, the most significant factor, not just in uh, connecting the Israeli society to itself, but rather it's the most important school in the training path of every Israeli. You can ask all the leaders in Israeli high tech. What makes the Israelis better uh, than others in high tech? It's their experience in the IDF and uh, their military service, and uh, the uh, reserve service is also part of that. And I see it as a need uh, they're doing reserves, and it's not just uh, romanticism, even though rom romanticism is also important in uh, the Volcani Institute of the Ministry of Agriculture. They had, uh, they discovered this innovation. You could do this genetic change in olive, so it will uh, be connected less strongly to the tree. A shaker machine uh, gets them uh, to uh, drop from the trees in Spain. They, con they completely uh, ruled this option out because it goes out against uh, their uh, heritage of the entire family going uh, to uh, pick olives and shake trees. And so reserve for duty as well connects uh, the Israeli citizen not through the religion of rights, but uh, through duties. I think what disciplines our lives, that's much more the duties that you fulfill rather than the rights that you have. And people are yearning for that. What's mainly missing in Israeli society today is meaning. And one last thing, if I look at the 18 years in the security zone, especially the past, the last 15 years since the withdrawal from the Awali to the security strip, for 15 years the IDF was there in the same outposts, the same convoys, the same units, and the fixation is what led to this idea of uh, lacks any purpose or stay there because there weren't any reservists there. It's the reservists who bring different ideas, who bring criticism, who bring a completely different social discourse than that of foremothers. It's a dialogue of partners. I don't see the Israeli society and the IDF um, capable of working together without this shared service. One last thing, those who harmed uh, the uh, drafting of reservists to the IDF is the idea that uh, the by the uh, reservist uh, days were budgeted through the IDF budget because uh, and because that forced uh, the IDF to calculate what do we need and uh, it's a new squadron or reservist and they always chose the new uh, Air Force uh, squadron and I suggested that to Boogie when he was Minister of Defense and shut down divisions I said I am willing to be the commander of the dormant forces that you don't invest a shekel in in times of war we will invest in them because in time of need, I saw people who got into a tank after they weren't in a tank for 20 years, and just like a bicycle, it's as if they never stopped. I completely agree with everything Gershom said, but there is one organization that doesn't agree with that in, in Israel, and that's the IDF, and Gershom mentioned the agreement from the mid-1980s, not by chance, it's Haq Rabin, was Minister of Defense, and he said that the cost of reserves, I don't want to get into all the uh, details here, but that the cost of reserves service uh, will be paid by uh, the defense budget. Just so that you understand the numbers between then until 2000, the outbreak of the Second Intifada, the number of reservist days that the IDF used was reduced by 90% because the 
idea of preferred uh, the technological armament over the uh, reservist uh, soldiers. And I'm not going to get into the question whether it was the right thing or due to not. And then in the 1990s, when this organization led by Ophir today was initially established as the Forum of Battalion Commanders and Brigade Commanders, and it addressed the social problems of reservists. Today, it is a, mainly a crisis of meaning, and it's a crisis of meaning that's dictated by the IDF. The IDF notified reservists uh, by its actions that it doesn't intend to use them, first of all, and that merits a, a different uh, seminar. But also, when he does that in, a lim in the limited way that he did it, for example, in Operation uh, uh, Defend, uh, Protective Edge, there wasn't even one unit which was a reservist unit, including uh, the elite units that are part of the IDF spearhead. And uh, this thing that they did in practice, not in words, in practice. This is what led to this uh, situation in the reservists say, I don't care what kind of remuneration or payment I receive, and I'll address these points soon. But first and foremost, if you, the IDF, are telling me that you do not intend to use me in order to uh, defend the state of Israel, then there's no reason for me uh, to do reservists because no remuneration will get me to do that. So the second point, and everything Gershon has said is just fine, except for the issue that there weren't reservists in the security zone. It's on purpose because in the first withdrawal in 1993 to the Awali, Misha Arendt, who was the Minister of Defense, they said they withdrew because of the reservists. And the reservists, and you remember this just as well as I do, because I was one of these reservists. There are others as well. They finished their reserve duty, and they went to demonstrate. And um, ever since, the number of uh, reservists and active reservists in the IDF today serves 20 days in three years. That's nothing. And uh, the active reservists, uh, who's a platoon commander, Anibab, when they serve as you used to serve in the past 40 or 50 or 60 days, they face a situation that within the civil society, let's say when he's interviewed for a new job, he's not five of 10. And then the mere fact uh, that he's a battalion commander or brigade commander in reservists, that shows that he has a personal capabilities, he's one of 20, and the other 19 won't lose a month or two of work every year because they don't do so much reserve duty. So there is no solution to that. Within the current reservist model, Eyal was also a member of the committee that you mentioned 20 years ago. And this is why what we need to do today, and I'll elaborate on this later, to switch to a reservist model that I completely agree that we need it. But those who need it, first of all, following what Amidrol said, they have to be well equipped, excited, and integrated, what I call a regular routine soldiers with wrinkles. They need to be, you know, as well trained, as uh, well prepared as uh, the uh, conscript soldiers. And uh, that's a small number, and the rest should switch to a different reservist model. I'll talk about that later. Hello, good afternoon. I don't think uh, that uh, we are in a crisis just now. The crisis has been going on for a long time now, for many years. It has peaks. It has its ups and downs. Usually, it comes up in a correlation, in direct correlation to campaigns and wars. And then we feel it. And then we feel uh, what uh, this uh, crisis uh, brings us to. It's made up of many layers. There's uh, the professional element, the human one, and I think that the human element today is the strongest, and the uh, association, which was actually several forms that came together, the forum of uh, battalion commanders and pilots, it uh, understood it back then. Back then, the crisis was even greater. There were these uh, absurd situations, and the reason, for example, why it was established, uh, this uh, association, is that a reservist wasn't insured like a conscript. If, they, if somebody would have been injured or killed in battle, a reservist, uh, then he wasn't insured to the same level. It's as if his blood wasn't equal to that of a conscript. So, of course, there are so many injustices and distortions. Some have been rectified, others have not. But this 
crisis is uh, slowly and gradually becoming even more significant because ultimately we are a changing society. If in the past doing reserve duty for the sake of society was very legitimate today, it's the individual who's king, today the I is king. People look at themselves and they don't only ask, oh, what can I give? They also think, uh, how, where am I in this situation and how am I harmed? Because when a soldier goes to do reserve duty, uh, they are harmed. They're not equal to those who work with them or to those who study with them in university. The army, the, in the state of Israel, of course, reserve uh, service is uh, mandatory, is a must, because this is uh, what uh, will provide, uh, which will decide the battle or the grand war. And we've seen in the Second Lebanon War, it really stood out. And we've seen over the years that when we actually needed these reservists, that's where we encountered problems. Uh, the Second Lebanon War, I believe, was one of the greatest crises of reserve service. The military went to war when the preparedness uh, was um, flawed. We didn't have the equipment. We are all familiar with the stories. Just a few years before that, there was a discussion in the Foreign Affairs and a Security Committee. We also participated in that committee. And we said, we're not prepared. We're not sufficiently trained. We don't have enough equipment. And the Chief of General Staff at the time stood up and said, guys, that's nonsense. We will summon you to do reserve duty. You're going to uh, tarnish and polish your swords for two or three days. Then you'll go to war, and everything's going to be OK. And then we saw what happened uh, for three years after that in 2006. So. Uh, the operational value is critical for the military because the reservists give the military the flexibility it needs in order to do everything it has to. And it's not just in operations and campaigns, it's in other matters as well. Let's say COVID, two or three years ago, uh, when COVID broke out, the Home Front Command, I'm part of that command, was fully uh, committed and mobilized in order to help the State of Israel overcome this crisis. The conscription was, happened overnight, and uh, you know, now in this past year we have uh, the uh, weight break uh, campaign, we're all familiar with it, and uh, they uh, also conscripted uh, various uh, uh, reservist battalions, and all that happened overnight. And if what uh, the law that we passed in 2008, according to that law, we said that it uh, allowed it to mobilize for operational activity once every three years, now it's happening once a year. Uh, that uh, completely changes the order. It changes everything. Now, the main problem is not the soldiers, it's the commanders, the uh, company commanders, the battalion commanders. For them to do these operational activities once every year or two, it means to constantly do reserve duty continuously. So this crisis is an ongoing one. It's a major crisis, but I'm not sure that it's a very topical one. I, we are a strong country. The soldiers are still coming. Probably they'll continue to come whenever there is summoned. But how are we going to build these uh, protective uh, layers in order to protect them when they do their reserve service? But that's something we'll have to discuss at another time. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not going to talk so much about the operational and economic aspects because what I'm about to say does uh, have operational implications. And let me say the following. The uh, reserve forces since the 1980s, just like Ophel said, it has more and more characteristics of this voluntary um, um, soldiers for hire, and it's not uh, such a voluntary military uh, yet, uh, but uh, let me give you some examples of the reserve duty law from 2008 embodies this when they started giving the reservists pay and various incentives, uh, various material incentives, uh, let's say help in mortgages, special scholarships, for academic studies, uh, the special benefits uh, that are linked to the number of reservists. And these are characteristics of a voluntary mercenary military. So the organizational model towards the reserve forces to a great extent became based on a rationale, a specific rationale. Paradoxically, at that time, 
the reserve forces continued to embody, not just symbolically, but also in practice, the perception of a, a popular military. Let me give you some examples. There are three studies. One is an ongoing one in the uh, unit for the research of behavioral uh, um, activities and also a research by Ronen Itzik. Most uh, of the reservists who actually serve are indeed uh, combat soldiers. Uh, many of them, the majority, are middle class, especially upper middle class, who can afford to do that. And the most interesting thing is that what characterizes them is high motivation. So that's quite paradoxical. They are motivated to serve, and that's translated into commitment and loyalty. And we see that mainly in times of emergency, just like what Ophir mentioned. We've seen this uh, in uh, previous campaigns. Uh, there is an over a 100% uh, presence uh, and attendance. And uh, this, uh, what I'm talking about, is empirical. But this tension between the traits of a professional mercenary military and the embodiment of a popular army uh, brings up up uh, various uh, meanings regarding the role of the reservists in the military, the uh, social role, and Yaakov Amidror talked about it, that it uh, gives people knowledge and uh, maturity, and the reservists, and Gershon mentioned this, were historically the ambassadors of the military in the civil society, and uh, the um, uh, the decreased size of the military uh, further reduces this role. And uh, perhaps you'll ask questions about uh, this later, but I'd also like to say that the political, not partisan, but political role of the reservists, because in the activity of the reserve forces, it reduces uh, the uh, leeway of the decision makers, but we can uh, talk about that later. So thank you very much for this round. You can keep the mic, actually, because I'm going to uh, ask you the first question. So you've just said that along with the fact that the military is becoming the reservist military is uh, becoming more and more like a voluntary mercenary military. It's also trying to maintain its status as the people's army. So I am wondering how this tension actually impacts the reservists. In practice, look, in practice, because the majority of those who serve come from uh, the middle class and upper middle class, you have uh, entire sectors of the uh, population. I'm not talking about those who are not uh, drafted at all, but uh, there are specific sectors uh, who don't do uh, reserve duty. Usually they're released either during their uh, mandatory service or in the selection process uh, when the military decide who it would like to continue with reserve duty and who uh, shouldn't continue. And we see this in research. It's very prominent that in uh, emergency times, the media uh, focuses on the uh, reservists uh, during campaigns, all of a sudden the, item, the number of items on reserve forces, including the personal reports, this uh, shoots up, and they are perceived as embodying uh, the uh, civilian soldiers, the people's uh, military, and even though it doesn't have any kind of a manifestation with respect to the type of people who actually serve. Thank you so much, Ophir. Now for the next question. Do you think uh, that uh, there's been a depreciation in the way the Israeli society yeah. perceives uh, uh, those who do reserve uh, service uh, or reserve duty? Yes, 100 percent. In the past, uh, uh, Reserve service was much more legitimate, but today, because uh, no, that's the situation all over the world, people are much more individualist. They uh, mainly care about themselves. They're a small family circle. They're a small close circle. And so when they go to contribute of their time to military service, people look at that uh, differently. And definitely, you know, the uh, soldier's environment uh, doesn't do reserve duty. Today, about six 
Reservists first stand are registered for reservists, but the active reservists, it's about 1.5%. That's nothing. That's nothing in comparison to the entire Israeli society. So it's most likely that the person sitting next to me at work or my boss specifically doesn't do reserve duty. So when we do reserve duty, everybody says, yes, we appreciate reserve duty. We appreciate what you do. Uh, but uh, your husband or wife don't really appreciate that. They make it difficult because they have a career and it interferes with their career. The student in the university, I'm not that sure that they enjoy going to do reserve service. And even the university doesn't provide uh, the kind of support it's supposed to provide, even if it's written uh, in the law. And it's written uh, in a way that's a bit, uh, you know, uh, indirect. And it's not clear how, how much it should support. So you say, OK, but I'm going to miss out on a test. And another student will take that test and will get a higher grade than mine, not to mention workplaces where it's most difficult because bosses today no longer see it as legitimate. They look at their business. When it's a small business, it truly harms the business. Let me tell you a small secret not everybody understands today. When an employee goes to do reserve service, actually the employer subsidizes these reserve days for the state of Israel by 30%. He pays the soldier's salary and the state actually uses the employer. So why should the employer consider it as legitimate when society today, competition is enormous, the economic competition or competitiveness. And so uh, workplaces don't consider it the way it is. And this is why it's more difficult. But when you do hold service, they say, yes, but we truly appreciate the reserves. You know, at the bottom line in the check, you need to write. That's not the case, not in university, not with the employers. The smaller ones, there are other larger ones who do uh, back up, but definitely not in the uh, small social circle or environment or family circle of that soldier who does reserve duty. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll have time for questions from the audience at the end. At the end of the panel, there will be time for questions. And if we just spoke about this deceleration that we spoke about, then the GISS um, surveys, the results will be publications about what the, what the population thinks about the actual um, reservists. Just beforehand, sort of on the tip of the iceberg, you presented to us in the research that you wrote for the INSS, you wrote about a new reserve model that would be actually multidimensional, a kind of semi-professional one. And you sort of emphasized quality rather than quantity with a need to streamline. So I was wondering if this, there is a reasonable sort of maturity in the state of Israel for that kind of idea. And Gadi Eisenkopf beforehand said that if should there be a scenario of a multi-arena one, then what would happen? then we were going to find ourselves in such kind of situation. So would this meet its needs, that kind of model that you suggested? Look, G Gadi and I have spoken about it many a time before that, but that scenario, then some of them will have a tremendous um, force to actually protect and defend uh, the home front. And that is something that the actual reservists could help with. But this is actually a derivative of uh, a different way of looking actually at the army. I mean, at the moment, you've got three kinds of armies one is the, uh, the con conscripts, the second is, are the reservists. It's not as someone at the age of 18 decided that they wanted to be officers and went to West Point and chose a career, but it's rather they have sort of sprout, sprouted through our ranks, and it is a small kind of voluntary army. So we have to sort of uh, pool all these together. But in that scenario, as they call it, that will be multi-arena, multi etc., etc., you have to really decide on what are the real needs of that force, including the reservists. And as Ami Draw said, the reservists have not come to take over from the, reg from the regular force, but they are people that need to be activated 
as quickly as possible. In addition, Golani, for example, if we're talking about, you know, a brigade, like um, at, at some point, it takes a good week to actually move the uh, whole brigade from, from the north to the south. So it has to be intelligence people and Air Force people and, and other forces as well. But they have to be prepared so that if I call them up, they can come actually uh, and they should be remunerated just like the standing army salaries are, just like in the United States, by the way, because they they have to, you have to think about the the social um, detrimental effect it has and the fact that their their households are left behind, etc. Now, but I mean, after all, there will be kind of hibernating forces, and if we need them, there will be a way of arousing them and bringing them. And uh, and we're talking about the maximal scenario and not just a kind of minimal situation. And you have to take all these people and remove them, con sort of concentrate them from that kind of uh, gray area into a real black area and use them for the, re re the needs that actually exist. But you're talking that you actually agree to the idea of a society that is uh, really mobilized and armed. But we're talking about a motivation crisis as well when we're talking about this crisis. So moreover, how do you think that that could possibly happen? How can we mobilize society? So there's a professor of sociology sitting here. And I think from my experience, motivation is something that can be changed with the right kind of leadership, the right kind of context. Within an hour, you can change it. So look at what Putin did. He didn't understand that collectivist um, resistance, that public, um, that he did not understand is something that we should analyze and learn from. From, because it basically it extricated a kind of and created a potential that people didn't even know existed. For five years, I was the actual um, battalion commander of, of a reserve um, battalion. And I remember for three years, and I remember what it was like going back and, and missing university for weeks on end. And we're talking about a mathematics course that was for three weeks, that you had four, hour, four weekly hours. And I went back and... and uh, and uh, everyone immediately in those days supported me. But unfortunately, I don't know if that happens nowadays. I was really fortunate. Immediately, everyone was helping me and because I didn't know what was even going on in the class. I'd missed so much. Now, but if I look, for example, at a reserves division when they come back, they want people to talk to them. They want. So when I took. It, it's like actually, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, it's like going to visit your grandma. What do you want exactly? Your back hurts a little bit. You want me to take the rubbish down? No. So these reserve commanders of divisions want partnership. They want to be listened to and they want to be talked to. And we need to do that. Commanders have to know how to do that. Uh, look, I won't tell you everything. Unshort, unfortunately, you know, time is short here. But this is this is connected to one of the biggest mistakes that we have made: is that we still have not actually been sort of extricated from the trauma of Yom Kippur, that everyone come, and within 24 hours they've got to be on the front. They come to the actual to the training um, meeting, and boom, they've all got to be sent over. There are those in regular army who don't exactly know what's going to be happening, so they have to be prepared to bounce up and go to the first line. 
And so those people have to be trained at a, a level of training that is very similar to those of the regulars. There is a kind of second level and a third level. So if someone comes to the actual, to the emergency actual unit where they have been called up to, they have to be ready within moments to do it. When I actually remember, I remember actually it's, at some point I actually was a, uh, my brother had a bar mitzvah and I was actually sent off. And all, also during the, the the actual campaign in the north at the time, in the, in the war in 82, I, the moment I went in, I had to go into Lebanon, and uh, immediately we had a whole call up, and I had to, there were people actually from the, the, the actual armored vehicles, I had to actually have people, I had to remove people, but they didn't even have uniforms on. So, the motivation is very high, but everyone has to know what the situation really is. I remember one of my soldiers who had a state of the army um, uh, armor and, and weapons in, in Golani, and suddenly he's been low graded to an infantry officer, and yeah, and uh, with absolutely no weaponry that is cutting edge. So, yes, you have to be prepared. We will drill you in exercise you, but you are, and yes, you won't have the same weapons, you won't have the same kind of responsibility, but you have to explain to them that they are still partners in it all. And I think the greatest burden on a reserve in duty, don't forget, is during the, the most burdensome time of their lives where they're building their careers, building their lives, their married lives, their families. For example, if you look at the paratroopers, for example, from the Northern Command, a soldier once said to me that the soldiers can to me that are 40, that I've got people actually in physical, they physical um, capabilities that are better than even their, their reservists because they've been training and they actually went off to, to fight in the Ukraine, for example. Some of them came from, I mean, all of them came from different areas. 40, 50 year olds are first class combatants. So the system has to be, un understand this, it has to be more flexible because there are people who are in their 40s who want to and they're literally locking on the knocking on the doors and they want to join and they and they reserve and people don't sort of meet their needs they're not actually giving them that role so when we're talking about i mean this whole issue of of the reserves actually do they actually have an impact on the the le on the decision makers levels and the power to be now, if we're talking about the, if you remember Moti Ashkenazi and the other demonstrations after 73, and it continued in the first Lebanon war with Peace Now, and uh, the forum of the actual battalion commanders and uh, brigade commanders, and it was very interesting just before the COVID that the reserves wanted to go um, to actually people to be go back, even the people who actually were really trying to, to get out of it. You, you, you've got to ensure what the employment actually and what the deployment conditions are going to be. Don't forget that nowadays that, that you have those who already know people in the army and they use their sort of social networks and um, they are uh, sort of, they have their ins and outs and the powers to be and they can, yes, they could very possibly impact the decision maker's decision. I think in your opinion over the last years, the operational capability of uh, the, especially the field capabilities of the reservists uh, over the last years, and therefore there's a kind of hesitation to actually op to actually use uh, them in, especially if we're talking about combat campaigns. I think that what was demanded of the army was to invest in certain capabilities that they didn't uh, do so if we talk about surgical, technological sort of capabilities. And it's as if you invest in one of them and then the other one has a detrimental effect on it. 
uh, especially in the last two decades? Well, it's basically it depends on the actual period before war, after war. People make different decisions, but the reserve um, um, actually order has the reserve or that has basically been detrimentally effective. There were some committees that actually did change things, but there are units that are not being trained. It's also the equipment that they're not equipped sufficiently. If you're talking about the renovation of, of uh, equipment, etc., um, uh, uh, of uh, and they did so of the reserve, the field. We're talking about the field reserve or that. We've got sort of old-fashioned um, armament, uh, weaponry, and actually, and this had a detrimental effect from the point of view of the fact that, uh, don't forget, of, of the whole level and the whole standard of the those, those who are working on the emergency storage units, those who are working on, on so many of the other things behind the scenes, they were definitely detrimentally affected. But now, it, uh, the actual, what we did ensure that would happen in 2008 in the actual reserve unit would be the actual competence, in other words, the physical competence and the weaponry. And in other words, that uh, and Eisenkot has to come actually and present it all. What is the scope of the force and what kind of exercise do they have to keep to and what kind of level of exercise, etc., and capabilities do they have to? Unfortunately, this only happened a few, a few times and it should have happened at least once a year. So in other words, this kind of parliamentary really critique and auditing should be taking place in a much more intensive manner from the point of view of the competence, the physical capabilities, and the actual weaponry, the actual um, equipment. Now, uh, what, what I would like to talk about are the social ramifications. You have proposed that there should be a differentiation between those who actually do serve in the reserves, that there should be not only a professional investment in them, but also remuneration-wise. So I'm not asking you how that differentiation would take place from the point of view and how this will impact those groups that have not been invested in and an effort exerted in them. I mean, we're talking about the various strata, socioeconomic strata. I mean, what we're talking about is a very small group. And uh, Ophir spoke about it, and I also touched upon it, and the detrimental effect on their daily lives. <laughs> And it's impossible to now to really return, sort of return ourselves to old times. We have to take things seriously and look ahead. If you are a reserve soldier and your role, your designated role within that relative um, scenario, whatever it is, you have to feel that you are equipped, you are trained, and you are ready. And that's got... And it's not because there isn't enough money for reserves, because this is not colored money, but this is a kind of, this is actually a reserve, a, a reserve sort of pot that is ready always for the reserves. Petty cash pot kind of thing. If every reserve soldier will feel that first and foremost that they are relating to it in earnest from the point of view of equipping him and training him, then there are in the IDF, for example, in Golani, there are, we're talking about in the brigade, we're talking about hundreds of percent of reservists who turn up and they feel it. For those who feel, for example, that their tank is the tank that the that that he as an infantry officer had specific equipment um, and that the, the, the actual regulars who are beside him have that equipment and he believes that he has that capability and that he has been treated in earnest, then it's fine and people won't be complain. They will only complain when they are being bluffed. They don't come and complain when they actually show the re them the reality as is. And then there's no bluff here and no stories told. Gershon, we've seen that in moments of emergency, if we're talking about protective edge and if we're talking about 
the Guardian of the Wars and other campaigns. I just sincerely hope that you're going to give me an optimistic answer. Can you see this happening the next time that people will come in numbers en masse like they did then? This follows what you asked Eyal. Someone like Fagelin wanted to clo the, close down the whole idea of the model of a people's army because they wanted ro robots that would be no constraints, um, there would be absolutely no sort of conditions, and immediately the government could give an, or an order and they would go out to fight, just like Putin did, and we've seen it with, with the Wagner force and other things. But from our experience, we know that that, that option does not exist because we will always we will always have to mobilize the entire people of Israel, and I'm not frightened from the point of view of its um, influence on the decision makers and the powers to be in Israel, because I truly believe in the people of Israel. I know all the options that exist, and I remember that I was actually in a battalion commander. I was still Shalom Achshav. I mean, it's okay, but I think that have to mention Sharon. He became a prime minister at the beginning of 2001. It took him one year, three months, until he actually went out to Gu Guardian of the Walls. But it, it, to actually mobilize a whole people for war, you, ha you have to prepare that people. So his reason was that he came to Kalkilia Tulkarum during that campaign, and everyone actually applauds him when he comes. And we talk about paratroopers, reservists. They, they called, they called out to him. Don't forget, in those days, come on, we'll take us to Lebanon and bring us our coffins. We have to convene actually now before we end. So I just as a dessert, I'd like to actually ask a question that hopefully we will have operative conclusions to it. So I would like a short answer. What can we do in order to upgrade the the cost effectiveness, the inf the incentive, and the desire and the wish to actually go out to reserves and for those? I think first and foremost, I mean, basically ties in with a lot of what was said here. If you actually really coordinate what, what one's expectations are, but a real discourse with the reservists about what their needs are, and third, I quest to see how in the different kinds of reserves can you um, imber, um, entail upon, imbue that with meaning for all the different kinds of reserve duty. I don't think that there'll be any problem with those who will actually come and be ready to fight. I'm, I do not believe that there's any problem. Everyone will be there. That's what I believe. They'll all come, the reservists, and we will defend our country. I do not believe that's even a question. I do not believe that in the next few decades something will change. But so that reservists and the commanders during routine lives uh, would be able to reach, to get there, it, it, in a, an, an easier manner. So we have to make sure that all his defense layers around him should it be okay. In other words, that the fact that his employer will immediately will get a remuneration because he's been taken away as an employee, that then it'll be easier for him to release him, that his household, his family, school, whatever he's at. In other words, all those soldiers, all the reservists, all their sort of the layers surrounding them, if you're talking about their private lives and, and their employment, then it will, they will be at a, an equal standing with everyone else in the state of Israel for those who do not go to reserves. As those who spoke before me, um, I agree, I second what they said, because I want a reservist to hear the truth, and I want him 
and uh, I want him to be really be trained in a much more serious manner, and they are being, by the way, trained in a much more serious manner, but I want them to feel that they are prepared. And by the way, even David Ben-Gurion said that the reserves are, first and foremost, you have to talk about the commanders of the reserves, because don't forget that in a state of battle, most of them are the commanders who go ahead and they feel and the the burden by the way upon their shoulders is not proportional to anything so first and foremost you need that the commander of the reserve unit and the reservist they're the ones that have to be retained and they have to you have to ensure that they are fully padded in their lives when they leave it now first of all when the idf tells the story about that um, they have to see what is happening beyond that. What is that first? When, I mean, the, the actually um, chief of staff said that people expect it to be a short war, but you have to say it very clearly that it could be dragged out. And that is the reference that we've got to actually talk about. So we need that kind of safety net. Any juggler in a circus can do all sorts of things because they have a safety net. No one comes to see them falling, but it is there. So exactly the same. So if, you, if a reservist says, hey, do not belittle what their role is. They have to understand that there is no alternative to having a safety net threat, uh, sorry, a safety net, so therefore it has to be well padded and they have to know that they have that safety. So thank you very much to all the speakers, to um, Professor Eyal ben and Gershon Cohen and Ophel Shellach. And what about women? We've spoken about a crisis and I think that that is very important. The f I think that uh, there's actually a surplus of motivation it's, uh, with women. But don't forget that women are 17% of the, the reserve, and if we're talking about the social value, that the IDF is the most actually significant network for social mobility in the State of Israel. And Karen Ayogev was sitting here, and yes, we have to strengthen the status and the scope of how much they serve, because we believe that equal service should be really is one of the keys to an upgrading of every level of our army. And therefore, we have to take that into account and ensure the upgrading of their status as well. So if you don't mind coming over to me for a small token from our institute for each and every one of you, and I... We're going to have a lovely musical interlude. If Avichai Peretz, a composer and singer, reserve soldier, could he please join us and be ready? He's going to, we're going to enjoy the musical interlude in a moment. But first, I'd just like to give out these tokens. Now I'd like to introduce Avichai Peretz. He's a singer, songwriter. Please, Gvaram, be seated. He's a reserve soldier, and he's going to uh, sing uh, this song, which somebody mentioned as the uh, anthem of reserve duty. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Avichai, a singer-songwriter, and I uh, do reserve duty in the Alexandroni uh, Brigade. I'll tell you what uh, the reserve forces need. This wasn't said before. We need a song when we upload a picture to our Instagram story, so uh, somebody decided to write a song about reservists, and this story starts at a training we had at Bislach. I am 37 years old, and I arrived at the morning lesson late, and the 21-year-old officer reprimanded me and uh, sent me out, and I was thinking, why? Why do I keep doing this? And I wrote a text message to my officer. I said, Cooper, it's the last time that I'm coming. 
Cooper uh, asked, uh, sent me back a smiley, an emoji that's laughing hysterically and says, you keep saying that, you always say that, and then the training uh, ended, I was set free, and on my way home, I was thinking about uh, this uh, tune, and if you know it, you're welcome to join me. חשבתי מילואים, זה כמו גבעת חלפון, הבנתי ששיקרו לי באימון הראשון. יורד לדרום, פוגש את החברים, משאיר בצד עבודה, משפחה ולימודים. חותם על נשק, עולה על מדים, מתעצבן ומקלל, אבל יוצא למילואים, ילדים. אני יוצא למילואים. אבא בא עכשיו הולך אל הצבא כל פעם לקצין אני נשבע זו פעם אחרונה שאני בא עד מתי שמירות מערבים עוד, רג, עוד רגע אני בן ארבעים נשבר לי כבר הגב מכל האימונים בוכה ומתלונן אבל יוצא למילואים ילדים אני יוצא למילואים, אבא בא, עכשיו הולך אל הצבא, ילדים, אני יוצא למילואים, אבא בא, עכשיו הולך אל הצבא, פתאום פורצת מלחמה, שוב ישראל בחרדה, אצלו המדינה קרוב ללב גם אם הוא בחו"ל הוא מתייצב חיבוק אחרון לאישה ולילדים נושא תפילה בלב ויוצא למילואים ילדים אני יוצא למילואים אבא בא עכשיו הולך אל הצבא ילדים אני יוצא למילואים עכשיו הולך אל הצבא. תודה רבה, תודה רבה. אנחנו יוצאים להפסקה, בבקשה להתייצב פה בשש ועשרה. אנחנו מתחילים בשש ועשרה בדיוק. בכבוד, תודה רבה.